Welcome in to another episode of Betting the Pitch. This is the first uh, of the match day episodes. Uh, if you want to check in on English Premier League, uh, League uh, or Bundesliga futures, please check on the previous episode as that's what I went through. I'm not going to be covering that on today's episode as we're simply talking about lines that will get you paid within two hours of the game starting. Um, I am the real underscore G Warner on Twitter. Uh, you could probably feel from my energy that I'm really excited for the soccer season to get going. I'm looking forward to getting out there on the pitch and I will be doing a trip for Oktoberfest to Germany. So if anyone's out there, feel free to look me up. I'm trying to hit as many games as possible while I'm there. Uh, I believe I'm going to Dortmund and to Bochum uh, and then potentially to Leipzig for the German national team and Vienna uh, for Austria. We'll see if that all works out. Hopefully Lord willing and the Creek don't rise. We get there. Um, as I'm recording this from Dallas, Texas, and I guess I might as well throw in a Southern reference. So I'm going to go through the three leagues that are starting today. Uh, full card, trying to give a best bet for each of the leagues, and then ultimately one that I will grade myself upon for each episode. Um, I will start here where the money is, and that's in the English Premier League, a 2 p.m. Central Standard Time start, uh, Central Daylight Savings Time, whatever the time is. Uh, 2 p.m. here in Dallas is when this whole thing gets underway. And currently, uh, we have Crystal Palace hosting Arsenal in what could be a very, very tough match for an Arsenal club that have a lot and very high expectations this year. They don't have European issues for this matchup, but probably that will plague them a little bit as we move through the season. Uh, Crystal Palace, they're a, a younger team that, of course, are managed by Arsenal legend Patrick Vieira. Um, I think their biggest question mark for me entering into the year is how they score goals. Uh, they lost Connor Gallagher back to uh, Chelsea because he was on loan last season. Have they really replaced him in the midfield? I'm not sure, at least not in the same way with a goal scoring threat. Uh, Wilfried Zaha is always really tough to predict. And I feel like that's a, a fairly big problem, but Crystal Palace do have a huge crowd booing them. Uh, especially they were incredible in the standalone Monday night matches should be a madhouse, a nut house today uh, on Friday for the opener. And I feel like it's a pretty tough draw for Arsenal two straight years, having to go into the lion's den after opening up the season last year at Brentford and things did not go very well. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a good test for an Arsenal club that have high expectations, have done a lot of transfer business, have brought in a, a lot of talent um, and we'll see if they can deliver upon that. I think it's going to be a big year for Mikel Arteta. You can't start off slow. Can't really um, have the the collapse that they did towards the end of the last season that kept them out of Champions League and forced them to Europa League. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of fixtures and a lot of a lot of things that Arsenal have to deal with they haven't dealt with before. Now, as for this match, Crystal Palace currently a half a goal underdog, getting odds plus 104 right now at home. That is the way that I lean for this opener. Over under is two and a quarter. Um, my biggest question though is how Crystal Palace score. Uh, I think Arsenal, they've shown um, basically ever since Gabriel Jesus came over, uh, he's been lights out, white hot this this preseason, scoring a ton of goals. Um, I do believe you need to take that with a, a fair amount or a fair few grains of salt because uh, it's hard to really see that there wasn't a lot of defense played in a lot of those friendly, uh, I guess, offseason matches. I do lean to Crystal Palace. I like them plus a half. Uh, and so they are one of my potential picks for the best bet for the English Premier League. Moving to Saturday, we'll start with Fulham hosting Liverpool. Uh, Fulham, the promotion, uh, newly promoted side that won the championship division based on an awesome, awesome goal scoring record. They were flying up the pitch. Um, they certainly had those parachute payments, which helped them to maintain their squad as they were only down one season in the championship. But uh, they've got a huge, huge step up in class when they host Liverpool fresh off the community shield victory, which I think was deserved. Um, they were in pretty good, good, good control of that matchup with Manchester city. Um, and Fulham currently are a one in three quarter goal underdog. Uh, and I think there's a lot to learn about Fulham in this one over under is three and a quarter. Um, Fulham, they certainly did well in the championship last year, but they're going to have to defend at this level. I'm not sure that they have the squad that's built for it. And I'm also not sure about exactly what strategy will be employed. Um, there's been rumors and things said about uh, their manager in the past that potentially Marco Silva is just not going to change his game plan. They're going to be as attacking as ever. Maybe that will get them three points, which are much more important than the draws and the low scoring matches against the big clubs. Certainly goal differential is an important thing to consider. 
Um, but I think from what I see and, and, and where I, I expect Fulham to be, it's against a team like Liverpool. They'll be seeding possession and they'll be trying to defend. I don't really like that setup for them, though this is obviously a monster number at home and might even climb to that plus two by the time this match kicks off as the big clubs tend to catch a ton of money right until kickoff time. Um, but 6.30 a.m., very, very early start, but I'll be up for it, looking forward to it. And I think I, it's a big question mark to see what Fulham do, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what their strategy will be entering the season. Next, we'll go to Bournemouth hosting Aston Villa. Bournemouth, another promoted side. Um, they finished second in the championship, and we're pretty comfortably in, um, but haven't done a ton with their team. I wonder if they're going to be one of those, see how this first few weeks of the transfer window, or excuse me, of the season go, and then try to attack the transfer window by spending money, but they haven't really done that yet this year. And that's a big concern for me because they didn't, they didn't, they're the, they're worth least in the entire premier league right now at just over $150 million, according to the transfer market. Uh, and they are hosting Aston Villa who come in who spent a ton of money on their side um, really and kind of had disappointing returns considering where they finished based on the money they spent. However, this is the first full season under Steven Gerrard who has shown that he can play defense and I think the big question for a lot of the clubs at the mid table and the bottom half is, can they score goals? Bournemouth, it's going to be a counterattacking side. I feel like they're fair, uh, much better prepared for this style of play that they're going to have to defend and counter than Fulham, for example, who we just discussed. Um, but do Bournemouth have the talent to really hang with other sides like, like Aston Villa, who are, are worth all, half a million dollars, excuse me, half a billion dollars in squad value according to transfer market. Bournemouth currently a half a goal underdog at home, minus 116 is the juice. Um, so it's pretty expensive to back them at home right now, um, though a draw wins you a full bet. I think Aston Villa is someone I'd like to go against. I, I don't know that I believe in their offensive output just yet or really whatsoever. They, they brought in some players, certainly. Um, that was one of their big questions last year. It wasn't really that they would defend. It's how they can score. Ollie Watkins is a great presser, but uh, he misses a lot of chances, unfortunately. And I think when you look at, at their side, how much is Coutinho going to play this year? I think he's available for this one. They certainly brought in a, a very important piece in Diego Carlos to play center back for them from, from Sevilla. Uh, also a very big threat in the box with headers. Um, but they just sold Chukwameka to Chelsea, um, which maybe talks about trying to bring back some money though they seem pretty deep at the center center midfield type of position um Bubakar Kamara coming in from Olympique Marseille also another big big signing for them I, I still don't see a lot of changes though in their offense Danny Inks can certainly score goals but I feel like he's past his prime and it's tough to rely on him to score a bunch of goals uh Bertrand Traore not a great finisher Buendia has not really done well in this at this level Leon Bailey has been pretty hot this preseason but ultimately uh, he's going to have to do it in a, in a match in the Premier League when it counts. And I, I feel like there's a lot of bodies here, but not a lot of uh, goal scoring or clinical finishers. Uh, and I'm not really sure that I can expect too much. So I lean to Bournemouth getting a half of a goal. Next, we'll go to Leeds hosting Wolves. Leeds currently a quarter goal favorite. All the juice on Wolves. Um, and it's a little bit surprising to see where Wolves uh, ended up finishing the year considering they were uh, fighting for Europa League or European competitions. But there was... A lot of noise within that team or a lot of um, they, they basically scored no goals last year and somehow were in the running for Europe, which isn't really how that usually works. Their defense is awesome. Um, it's very unlikely that Jose saw their keeper will have as good of a season this year. Um, certainly seeing them getting a quarter of a goal from Leeds, who they finished, uh, let's see, 10 places, no, seven places above and 13 points ahead of over just 38 matches. So that's a pretty big discrepancy between the two. Um, but Wolverhampton definitely have a lot of problems. Um, I'm not sure that they um, are, they see Leeds as a big threat, which is a big, big, a bit scary for them. I think Bruno Lage has showed that he's going to um, play a conservative style, similar to the way Nuno Espirito Santo played before. Um, and that does lend pretty well to uh, unders as was over under is two and a half, which seems pretty high. A lot of juices on that under. Um, but Wolves getting a quarter and what could be a goalless matchup does seem like uh, there's some value there. Uh, when I look at the ability for Leeds to score, I wonder about what's going to happen with Patrick Bamford, if he's, if he's available for this match or not. If he isn't, then who does the goal scoring fall down to? Maybe Gelhardt off the bench or Greenwood, not really um, starters that we would expect or, or players that we'd expect a lot from. Uh, Rodrigo has kind of shown that he's not really 
the quality player that that they need in the English Premier League. Daniel James is playing as like kind of a false nine winger that was forced into striker position last year, and that might speak to why Leeds were fighting the drop until the last day. Um, Sinistero who came in from Feyenoord is a certainly a good option, but um, can't really expect too much out of him in his debut. And Jack Harrison kind of feels like he's alone on the left side. Brendan Harrison, who's popular with Americans like myself, and is really looking like an important player for the U.S. men's national team. I know not important to everyone watching this, so I'll, I'll make that um, as, as quick as possible. But he's 21, coming in from Salzburg, pre- previously played under Jesse Marsh, and we'll see what happens. I think um, there's some questions about Tyler Adams, who didn't play a lot for Leipzig. And in going through this entire roster, which I really wasn't meaning to do, um, I have questions about how they score goals. So I'm also interested in Wolves getting a quarter, though, to be frank. The Wolverhampton ability to score is not exactly profound, and that concerns me quite a bit as well. I think when I look at Raul Jimenez potentially not available, um, that's not a good sign. Adama Traore is not – he's proven he's a great physical specimen. He has a lot of speed, and he has a great ability to cut to his right and cross into the box. But I don't know who he's finding, unfortunately, and I don't really know what to expect so much from – this Wolves attack. So it doesn't feel like there's a lot of goals there, which certainly lends to an underdog play. Um, so I lean to Wolves getting uh, one quarter of a goal. Next we'll go Tottenham hosting Southampton. Currently Tottenham, a one and a half goal favorite with all the love uh, preseason as their, um, their price to, to win the premier league. As I mentioned on the podcast, Mackenzie rivers is that they've dropped from 30 to one to, I believe 12 to one. And it looks like that's what they'll kick off at. I don't know that they're necessarily on the level of Liverpool and Man City, but they're close. And Southampton had a disastrous end to last season. They haven't really done a ton to bolster their squad. I think they're one of those uh, clubs now that we we rely upon, we believe in. uh, But a lot of times I feel like I need to see it first. Um, A lot of people are picking them potentially as a relegation candidate. And uh, having to go to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and hang within a goal seems like a big tall task for a team that has one of the worst striking combinations possible. Uh, James Ward Prowse is always at risk or is always a scary proposition to get loose. But um, from where I sit, I feel like Tottenham are one of the best teams in the league. And I'm going to try this year to spend as little time fading the best teams possible, unless I really like their opponent. Southampton leave plenty to be desired and they will not be on my list. Newcastle then hosting newly promoted Nottingham Forest. Uh, Forest who won the playoff got pretty fortunate not to, can see the penalty that might have squared the game off, but then spent a ton of money, are no longer the lowest valued club in the Premier League. They brought in, I mean, great strikers like Taiwan Awani from uh, Union Berlin. He's going to be perfect in this kind of counterattacking setup. Steve Cooper um, sounds like a, a great manager who has had a lot of success at many places, nearly got Swansea promoted. Um, were a, he was able to promote Nottingham Forest in the playoff this season after failing last year with Swansea, but what he's going to do, as far as I understand, is play a counterattacking brand. And I think that's exactly what you need in this uh, level of football. Uh, when I look at Nottingham Forest, I mean, bringing in Jesse Lingard, we'll see what if they can get that magic in a bottle like he had a couple seasons ago at West Ham. I uh, already mentioned Awani, who's a great um, hold-up player, but also is a little bit faster than you expect. He's a big, big body. Uh, and bringing in Musa Niakate from uh, Mines, the former captain, uh, he's going to bring a lot of toughness and strength to a team that probably needs it. I'm not sure exactly what to expect, um, but I, I think from where I sit with, with Nottingham Forest, I, I like what they've done, and I like the idea that, that they have a strong manager who believes in a counterattacking system, and that's going to be very important, um, especially against Newcastle, who have a ton of money but really haven't spent as much as you'd expect uh, the Saudi investment group to to come in. And I'm not really sure what to expect with them because they weren't able to score goals last season. They they made an amazing climb up the table from bottom to bring relatively safe very early uh, after the the acquisition of the club. But ultimately, their their goal scoring is a big question for me. I think Joe Linton is going to be healthy after sustaining an injury late in the season uh, or in that last match potentially. But Alan St. Maximan is tough to trust. And when you look at the line on this one, where Newcastle are a three-quarter goal favorite currently, minus 116, so all, all the juice right now. Uh, if Nottingham Forest can get to plus one, I'll be very interested and will play it. Uh, last but not least on Saturday, we go to Everton hosting Chelsea. They've moved to a plus one uh, full goal underdog at home, minus 125, so all the juice there. Um, Everton are a team that I picked as a potential relegation threat. 
beyond the recently promoted. And I feel like they will be fighting the drop, especially with the injury to Dominic Calvert Lewin, uh, who's I think out for a month, it seems like, and who knows how long it'll take for him to return from the injury and uh, to be as talented or, or show the, the, the form that he really hasn't shown. Cause he was missed a lot of the year last year too. Um, Chelsea, I think have a lot of problems. They're trying to chase uh, players at the end of the deadline, trying to buy Kukurea because um, Man City won't match their price. I feel like they're limited. The squad's unbalanced, and that's a big problem because they don't score a lot of goals. I just think Everton have enough problems that really they're going to have to rely on their 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 crowd and their stands to really keep them in matches. I think they do have the ability to hang with Chelsea, who have trouble scoring goals. Over under is two and a half, uh, juice to the under. So not a lot is expected from the goal scoring uh, portion of this matchup, but. That plus one is huge, so um, certainly wouldn't have any interest below one on Everton, um, but saying they're relegated and then potentially backing them week one against a top four team uh, seems a little bit questionable to me, so I won't do too much there. Next, we'll go Manchester United hosting Brighton on Sunday morning. Um, Manchester United, a minus three-quarter goal favorite uh, with all the juice on Brighton on the road. Excuse me, all the juice on, on Manchester United, so, so plus money uh, for Brighton on the road. Um, I am playing Brighton here at plus one, um, but I don't have that currently on the lines that I'm using. So I will wait and expect that Manchester United money will come in, will flow in and to push this to one. Um, I don't know exactly how to treat that for my best bets, but this is the first time we're doing it. So we'll see. I think I got to take it as the three quarters that I'm citing. So um, I'll be waiting to see that Brighton move to plus one. Manchester United have a new manager coming in from an unproven league. Certainly Ajax were great last season, but struggled in the knockout round of the Champions League and dominated a pretty soft group. So I'm not really a believer in them. I think the Cristiano Ronaldo distraction is a big problem for them. And ultimately they can't really go too far away from him uh, because they need his goals. Uh, they weren't able to score goals efficiently when Ronaldo and Bruno Fernandes are on the same, on the pitch at the same time, they don't really produce, uh, for the club a little bit better for the country, but that's been disappointing as well. Um, and when you look at Manchester United, they have a really strong wing or both wings. They have so many, so much depth at the wing position, but that doesn't do enough for them. They have potential problems with Brighton who are going to possess the ball for a lot of this matchup. And I just trust Graham Potter a lot more than I can trust Eric Ten Hag, who's making a big step to a much bigger league with much bigger expectations, though I certainly are great and have a lot of expectations in the Eredivisie. I just don't believe that um, this is going to be an easy climb for him. So I lean to Brighton getting three quarters of a goal and we'll be looking for that plus one. Next, we have Leicester hosting Brentford. Leicester, a half a goal favorite. Um, the bees Brentford were awesome last season. I did pick them to be relegated. They, uh, stayed up fairly comfortably despite a mid season swoon. Uh, they seem healthy now. And that's a big, important part. Uh, Lester have a lot of rumors going around. They might have to sell Fofana who is 21 years old and they just brought in from San Etienne as someone they certainly want to keep. They will cash in on a big profit from him, but defense was a problem for Lester with it without him last season. And if his eye is not on the prize, if he's not fully focused, that makes me worry about Leicester. Now, Leicester don't have Europe to worry about this season, which is huge for them. Um, they seem a lot healthier than they have been in the past, but they have an aging Jamie Vardy, and that's a concern for sure. Uh, Brendan Rodgers seems like he's on the hot seat, which is a concern. Um, but ultimately, they're a better side and are playing at home and will have a big crowd behind them. Uh, James Madison was awesome towards the end of last season, and I expect that to continue. Um, when I think about the rest of their lineup, I mean, Ian Acho wasn't great after starting the year really hot. Vardy came on towards the end, and we'll see if he can kind of keep that going. As far as I know, y Yuri Tielemans has not left just yet, but I thought that was happening, and I know Ricardo Pereira just has suffered a pretty big injury. Fortunately, they have he and James Justin both at right back, which they might need to fortify in the future. Um, but when I look at Leicester, I feel like there are questions about who they are and what they want to be this season, especially if they're going to be selling players. Whereas Brentford, we know that they're going to be the money ball um, filled with plenty of Scandinavians trying to be as as compact as possible. Um, they lost Christian Eriksen, who's really important to their end of season run that really got them sa to safety. Um, but they brought in some young players. Aaron Hickey from Bologna is seemed to be loved by everyone. And Ben Mee is an important center back to bring in from the recently in, in first season, I guess, relegated Burnley in a long time. But bringing him in there to reinforce the center back position is important. Uh, I don't know that he's going to be available um, with a broken bone in his calf, apparently, uh, for this matchup. But Pinnock 
and Janssen and Ayer was the the way that they wanted to start last season. I think that's going to be an important part for them, uh, especially with the goalkeeping battle with Ryan Strakosha coming in. So I'm very interested in Brentford um, getting a half of a goal. I don't know that I feel like there's enough there offensively for them to hang in Leicester. I still feel like are still pretty potent, uh, but it's going to be a good wait and see or look and see to, to get an idea of what I'm going to think about these teams entering the season. West Ham, the last matchup of the, of the weekend, uh, will be hosting Manchester City, getting one and a half goals at home. Uh, not a huge home uh, field advantage, home pitch advantage in the London Stadium because the fans are not on top of you by any means, but English soccer crowds are pretty strong. And West Ham, I feel like, will give Manchester City some problems. Um, West Ham, what they want to do, it fits right exactly how the game will play. They want to sit back, uh, defend and counter, use their height on set pieces. And I think that's an important thing that I think plays pretty well against Manchester City. Uh, City want to push everyone up the pitch. They want to have as much possession as possible. And they really want to use what used to be um, 10 midfielders on the pitch, essentially, all playing outfield positions. Certainly they have center backs, so maybe that's not fair. Eight midfield players, we'll put it that way, um, which they don't have anymore. Now they have at at most seven with uh, Erling Holland playing striker. And I think that's going to take a little while for them to kind of get to a point where they know what they're doing and they're consistent, they're cohesive, and they know where to find him in certain spots. Uh, You could see it in the community shield that Erling Holland would make certain runs in certain directions that the others weren't expecting. And that's certainly a concern, I think, for a team that's going to have to win by two goals on the road here. Uh, Man City certainly have most talent and look like a team that can beat anybody and by multiple goals. So that's certainly possible. Um, but when I look at the matchups last year, um, first matchup was in, uh, I guess, in Manchester. Man City won 2 1 after a 1 0 lead at halftime. There were some late goals, um, I guess, a flurry of goals after the 90th minute. Um, so it got a pretty good cover, you could say, but also, man. Uh, Man City were only up a goal for most of the the game or the match. Um, And then looking at the last one, they drew 2-2. And so at the London Stadium. So uh, pretty much, I mean, confirmed that West Ham covered one and a half in both of their matches last year, uh, probably profited or or covered the spread in both of those matches. And that's something that's important to think about. Um, I think when I look at these teams and trying to figure out that best bet for the EPL for this first match day, um, I then consider West Ham plus one and a half, Brentford plus one half, Brighton plus eventual one, but I'm not going to use that on this podcast because it's not officially there. Uh, but so I like a lot of the dogs on Sunday. Uh, Everton getting one is, is looking good. Nottingham Forest getting three quarters is important, but also is a big step up for uh, for the forest of the trees coming into the biggest league in the world. Um, Wolves getting a quarter from Leeds, who I, I think struggled to score is of interest as well as Bournemouth at home in a counterattacking style against Aston Villa. I just worry about some of these newly promoted teams moving up to the next division. And I think that'll push me towards, believe it or not, I didn't expect that going into this podcast, but uh, because I don't have Brighton at plus one, um, I think I'm, I'm between Wolves at plus one quarter and West Ham at plus one and a half. And I guess I'll go with West Ham because they are stronger of the two sides. Um, they have a lot more invested in their, in their club. And I think have higher expectations for this season. So I'm going to choose for my best bet from England for this first match day as West Ham plus one and a half. Next, we'll go to the Bundesliga and it starts on Friday with Eintracht Frankfurt hosting Bayern München, the record champion, the record Meister, uh, a team that is probably expected to win uh, a ton of matches again this year especially against the the bigger or excuse me, the, the uh, smaller clubs. I expect that they will have a huge advantage. The big question is what, um, as I think most people are hoping that this will be a little bit more competitive than it's been in the past, but it's going to be the decision making decision will be made by how uh, chasing teams and contending teams for European positions, how many points Bayern will drop against them. Certainly there's some bad performance from Bayern that'll happen. seems like it happens against Augsburg quite a bit. Um, But they should be pretty focused on this matchup, especially after a pretty poor defensive second half against RB Leipzig and the Super Cup, um, which they did win on the road. um, And it seemed deserved to me because they took a huge lead, but also were taking advantage of a lot of defensive mistakes. Eintracht Frankfurt, they have a defensive manager in Oliver Glossner. He's going to sit back and try to defend and try to limit as much space as possible. 
Um, unfortunately, Bayern are used to that, and they have a lot more talent and attacking talent. So Eintracht Frankfurt with a great run in the uh, winning the Europa League to get to the Champions League um, was huge for them, especially because they weren't going to qualify for anything. So they really put a lot of their eggs in the Europa League basket, and it worked out very well. Um, in terms of what they brought in and trying to compete with the other teams in the Bundesliga, uh, Mario Götze is probably the most famous name coming back from from Holland was was huge. Um, and bringing in Kolomwani on a free transfer from Nalt was a great move. I didn't really lose a lot. So they've been strengthening the team quite a bit. Also, also, also Lucas Alario coming in from Leverkusen, a great move to really weaken a team that you're competing with for Champions League positions for next season. Um, when I look at this matchup, I, I think that Frankfurt can keep it close. They can hang around. The crowd should be good. Um, I do think that Bayern just have too much attacking ability. And I just don't know that even on the road, I don't know that one and a quarter goals is enough for me to to uh, to jump into the Frankfurt side. Um, in terms of these two teams when they played last season, um, I want to say they were pretty competitive, uh, but ultimately Bayern have a level in them that the other teams in this league simply just do not have. Uh, when I look at at the matchups to last year, um, I, the first matchup Frankfurt won at Bayern Munich oh, with a, a late goal, if I remember correctly. Uh, from, yes, from Kostic, who I think is on the move, which is unfortunate because he's a really important player for them and is someone that I want to make sure is in that lineup if I'm backing uh, Eintracht Frankfurt today. And the other matchup, a 1-0 a loss, it looks like, uh, in Frankfurt. So uh, another good matchup, uh, a late-ish goal, 71st minute from Leroy Sané. Uh, Frankfurt played them pretty tight and getting a goal in a quarter, I mean, Maybe it looks a little bit better than I thought even just seconds ago based on results from last year, which is hard to take uh, results based handicapping, especially from a season before. And it does make sense to throw out those results quite a bit. Uh, but Bayern, I think, are, are going to be weaker scoring goals. I think they were uh, great at taking advantage of Leipzig's mistakes last last week uh, in the Super Cup, but they're going to miss Lewandowski. And while Sadio Mane is going to be a great addition, I'm not sure he's going to make too much of an impact Um because they're certainly going to score less goals this year without Lewandowski. Next, we'll move to Saturday. We'll go to Union Berlin, hosting Erta Berlin, a Berlin derby. Uh, and Union giving three quarters of a goal is a pretty big price, uh, considering their lack of offense. But Erta have been a really, really struggling team for a couple seasons now. Somehow survived in the relegation playoff or the relegation. Um, I'm not sure that they really deserved it, but they got there, uh, got over the line, and that's all that matters. They stayed in the league yet again. Three quarters of a goal uh, with all the juice right now seems to probably be the peak of where Erta will close, but ultimately that's a bigger number than Union probably deserve as Union have been picked apart, selling off a ton of assets um, as they're a low-budget club. Next, we'll go to Augsburg hosting Freiburg, um, matchups of the Burgs. Augsburg did take Emerdin Demirovic uh, on a free transfer from Freiburg this offseason, which is a big loss for Freiburg, especially as they're trying to keep as many assets as possible as they move into a Europa League European competition, which was, I think, previously unthinkable for a team like uh, Eintracht, or excuse me, like Freiburg. Um, they have some rumors about other players potentially leaving, but losing Haberer to Union, not great. Demirovic, um, to Augsburg, as mentioned, is going to be tough in this matchup, especially. But the biggest loss, I think, is Nico Schlotterbeck from center back to Borussia Dortmund. He's a great player for him, and they certainly can try to replace him with Matthias Ginter, uh, who came over from Gladbach, a former Freiburg player. Uh, but ultimately, kind of what they're looking at, they brought in Gregorich as a free transfer, also from Augsburg, but he's just height that doesn't seem to be, uh, doesn't make too much of a difference. I want to say he was at Freiburg before as well. Um, he's been all over the place, it seems, but uh, I guess it's not been a Freiburg before. Anyway, um, in terms of looking at this matchup, I think Freiburg going on the road as a quarter goal favorite is questionable based on their inability to score goals. I think they made really where they got to as last season by doing it defensively. And that doesn't really uh, speak to going on the road and scoring more goals than your opponent. Uh, Ruzzo Duan coming in for PSV, formerly in the Bundesliga, will be a good creative player, uh, but working him in seems to be a question to me. Uh, and we got some injury concerns with Lucas Ola, also Kevin Schade. Um, So there's some questions certainly about um, the Bundesliga, I guess, surprise from last season. Um, I just don't know that there's a lot of goals in this Freiburg team right now. So I lean to Augsburg, though their relegation odds are very high this season. Borussia Mönchengladbach then hosting Hoffenheim, Gladbach giving a quarter of a goal, and that seems like a fair price 
Uh, these teams are pretty similar at home. Uh, Gladbach should should have a pretty good crowd advantage. Um, they were not great last year. They lost a lot of players, um, but potentially restarting under a new manager is important for them this season uh, and might get them going in a different direction. Daniel Falke coming in from Norwich um, was a big move. And certainly a- after he was removed from his post for Norwich um, after it looked like they were about to get relegated. We'll see what he does because he's an offensive manager. And, and I think it's important that that Gladbach return to the skillful team that they were in the past. Um, they haven't done a lot. They've just lost more players, sold Riel Embolo to Monaco. Um, and they really lost a lot of pieces, which is really sad to see because they were a, a really historic club. Hoffenheim, on the other hand, really struggled towards the end of last season. And I don't really see that changing too much here. Um, so it's going to be a wait and see to see what Hoffenheim do because they were so bad on the road last year. Bochum then hosting Mines. Uh, Bochum currently a quarter goal underdog at home. Mines with the already lost Niakate moving uh, to Nottingham Forest. That's a concern for a team that really were really strong and physical in the back line. Um, in terms of other, they lost Jeremiah St. Just to sporting, though he wasn't really preferred late in the season. Um, and also Luca Killian going to, to Cologne is a concern. They did bring in Angelo Fulgini from uh, Angers, who's talented. Kashi from Strasbourg, who was in and out of the team. And then I just, I don't know really what to say about them. They still have the Johnny Siwo, Jonathan Burkhart, and Karim Onisivo together, uh, which is a great front line, but ultimately a great front line for a very low value team. I don't know how much Fulgini will do when he first comes into the league. Um, but certainly that's a, a club that is trying to remodel itself, whereas Bulcom are worth so little, um, worth only $41 million, so far below the rest of the league. They were really strong at home last year, and I think this is going to be a big, big question mark to see what Bulcom can do um, in a second year where a lot of teams have sophomore slumps. Um, they didn't bring in much. They, the highest expenditure they did was Philip Fulster who's not a great player from uh, Stuttgart at only 550000 They sold off. Uh, Maxim Leitch, their center back to Mines, uh, who will matter in this one, as well as Bella Kochap to Southampton. And so they brought in a lot of money, um, but they sold a lot of important pieces. And I think I'm really questioning their defense. I lean to that quarter of a goal at home, but I'm a little bit worried about where that club will stand and if their uh, home crowd can really buoy them like it did last year. Wolfsburg then hosting Werder Bremen, recently promoted, came in up as second place team, second place finisher in the Schweizer Liga. Wolfsburg were nowhere near as good as expected last season, started off really hot and then sunk like a rock. Um, they are a half of a goal favorite right now. Werder Bremen just don't have much money. They're a team I picked as a potential relegation side and where I think is my best bet on the future episode for Germany. So we'll see what happens. Uh, they don't have a lot of money. There's a lot of teams that are potentially going to get relegated from Germany this year. Um, a lot of teams in that fight. But I'm going to see what they do as a newly promoted side. So they shed a lot of salary as they went down to the Schweizer Liga. I think it's going to be a big test for Werder Bremen. And we'll speak a lot about both of these teams. The big one on Saturday is Borussia Dortmund hosting Leverkusen. Currently Dortmund a quarter goal favorite at home with all the juice. And I expect the the home crowd to be a huge, huge impact or huge factor for Dortmund. They're working in a new defense completely after being so poor last year with Schule and Schlotterbeck, the previously mentioned Freiburg signee. Uh, Leverkusen are going to be on the front foot trying to score a ton of goals and there'll probably be a bunch of goals scored in this matchup uh, three and a half is the total here which seems like a lot but ultimately isn't a ton for either of these two teams because they're going to be on the front foot the whole time uh, I actually want to pull up and see what the results were last year I feel like uh, three and a half feels pretty pretty short to me I mean you could say that Dortmund's defense is improved but I I, I can't say that um, assuredly until you see the partnership of Sule and Schlotterbeck, that's at least what I'm expecting it to be. Um, if transfer market would be a little faster, I can shout out some of these numbers. Um, but yeah, first time they first match they played uh, at Leverkusen was a, a 4-3 final, seven total goals scored. Second match they played, again, seven goals, two to five this time. So uh, that's, that's a match that should have some goals. I feel like the over three and a half is very much in play, though. Dortmund should have a much better defense this year. Moving to Sunday, Stuttgart hosting Leipzig. Stuttgart, a three-quarter goal underdog at home. And they're really hard to trust because they were not able to score goals last year. The home crowd pulled off some amazing escapes with some late victories that were really important to keep them in the league and keep them out of the relegation playoff. 
Uh, Leipzig coming off a pretty disappointing performance, especially defensively. I think they'll be very tight and intelligent about how they play defense here, but ultimately won't be under much threat from Stuttgart. Uh, Leipzig, a three-quarter goal road favorite. It's a big number, but I think it's deserved, and I wouldn't be looking at Stuttgart until I get that full plus one, and even that might not be enough. Cologne then hosting Schalke. Uh, Schalke finally back into the Bundesliga after one season away. They did win the league below them. Cologne, a three-quarter goal favorite with Europe on their sights. Um, or in their sights they're doing it this year they're a great goal scoring team last season we'll see what they do uh, this year I think when I look at these two teams they're not that different considering the three-quarter goal spread here uh, I don't know that I trust Schalke yet because they did shed a ton of salary just like Werder Bremen did as they went down last season I'm not sure what to expect from them this year and when I look at Cologne they seem to I mean the most important thing is maintaining St- Stefan Baumgart as their manager uh, and keeping Anthony Modest, but at 34, we'll see what he can produce this season. Also, S- Sebastian Anderson at 31. They're certainly not a young side, and I, that does worry me about what they can do uh, managing two competitions. But ultimately, I don't know that that Schalke are in a position that I want to back them just yet. So in terms of best bets for Germany, uh, as I'm promising to do that, I think on the list are potentials. Um, nothing really on Sunday, but that definitely that over three and a half uh, for Dortmund Leverkusen is a possibility. I think uh, Bochum are worth a look getting a quarter, but there's a lot of questions about the uh, capability of, of the financial situation there. Augsburg getting a quarter of a goal at home from Freiburg, I think are, are worth a look as is Erte Berlin getting three quarters of a goal on the road at Union. Eintracht Frankfurt getting one and a quarter, certainly a possibility today on Friday. Um, hopefully you're watching live and might, go along with that and play along with me as I I'm feeling more and more likely I'll like I'll play Frankfurt, but I want to make sure those lineups look good. I think when I play this one, my best bet for Germany will be the over three and a half in Dortmund and Leverkusen. Uh, it's tough when there's no overtimes to hit overs because they don't call it under time for a reason, but from where I sit, I think there's going to be a lot of goals there. Um, it's going to take a little while for Dortmund to get their defense to a position where they're as competitive as they needed to be. Uh, and they were so bad last year that they have too far of a climb, I think, at this point. Uh, so I'll take over three and a half in that Bundesliga matchup. Uh, so that'll be my best bet there. And we'll move now to French League 1 for the last part of the show. Uh, this also starts today on Friday. Lyon hosting Ajaccio, uh, recently promoted. Lyon a one and a quarter goal favorite. They don't have Europe to distract them this year. They can score a ton of goals. Their defense is an issue, but Ajaccio as the lowest uh, valued team at only $25 million, it shows the financial problems that you'll go from $25 million at the bottom of league uh, all the way up to over 1 billion in PSG. Uh, tough to say, but from where I sit, um, I don't know that I'm interested in backing the relegation side until they prove it, especially in a tough place to play with Les Gones in in Lyon, uh, and that's going to be a tough one for uh, Ajaccio. Moving to Ligue 1, we have Strasbourg on Saturday hosting Monaco. Uh, Monaco off of a tough draw, but they had to fight back from a 1-0 deficit uh, to take a draw uh, at home in their Champions League qualifier against PSV Eindhoven. Tough match, but good to get one out of the way. Questions about their legs, and certainly it was tough for them balancing the, the qualifying for Champions League and their early season start to Ligue 1 last year. Strasbourg uh, greatly outperformed expectations last season, uh, scored a lot more goals than were expected, and currently are a pick em at home with most of the juice right now. Um, I think I'm interested in Strasbourg here, especially Monaco on a quick turnaround and on the road, uh, but at pick em, there's not much for me to do. I'd like them to be an underdog, and I think if anything, it looks like Monaco will be that underdog, and I'd want to certainly look at that lineup before I could commit. Uh, later on Saturday is Claremont Foot hosting PSG. PSG, um, seven hundred billion or seven hundred million dollars with an M, uh, more valuable than the next highest team. Monaco is saying something, but Clermont Foot unfortunately lost uh, their best striker, who was bought away from them. I think went to Lille, and they're in trouble because uh, they are going to be an attacking front-footed side trying to score goals, and I think they're going to do that against PSG unless they completely change their strategy, which. Um, unfortunately, is is not probably likely in that first matchup. So I think this is a really dangerous game. Claremont Foot, a one and three quarter goal underdog at home, should even climb. I think above two is where it'll close. Over under three and a quarter. 
um, juice to the over. So I'd expect there's probably a lot of goals here, and it's a good opportunity to see this one. Unless Claremont are completely changing their style and going defensive, but I, I just don't think that's going to happen. There's enough for me that makes me wonder about it, so I, I can't say for sure. It's hard to say. Pastel Gatien has been there since 2017, and his contract expires into this season, so I imagine they will probably play a little more conservatively than normal. Um, but I don't know that there's enough here for me to even look for, further into this one. So we moved to Sunday. Toulouse hosting Nice. Currently Toulouse, a pick em, with all the juice on Nice on the road. And Nice have the money, uh, but their project was stalled when Christophe Gaultier, their manager, left for PSG. Um, Toulouse recently promoted. Um, I believe they won uh, Ligue 2 last season. But um, their question is, is what they're going to do as they move up leagues. I think they're a team. I'd like to back Toulouse in this matchup, if anything. Maybe they'll move to a quarter of a goal underdog before the starts at 6 a.m. local time here in Dallas on Sunday. Um, but I'm not sure that I want that one just yet at Pickham. Angers then hosting Nault. Currently Angers at Pickham um, with a little bit more of the juice on Nault on the road. Nault got their first matchup out of the way. A pretty bad loss in the, uh, I guess, the Super Cup um, to PSG um in some faraway land in tel aviv i believe so uh there's some travel significant there um uh, something to think about uh so i expect actually as as not move and they potentially move to a favorite uh maybe there's some value in backing angers but they sold off a ton of players this season unfortunately next we have montpellier hosting trois montpellier a quarter goal favorite and they were one of the worst teams the end of last season um across any of the top five European leagues. They were a disaster. And that's not a good sign entering a new year. Twa can score goals. Um, they're not the most talented for sure, but they do have the uh, some ability. They're worth about half as much as Montpellier. So that's a concern. But currently Montpellier, a quarter goal favorite at home with most of the juice. As as this one climbs and Twa get more of higher as an underdog, I think I'm more and more interested in them. Lille then hosting Auxerre. Lille, a three quarter goal favorite at home. Auxerre, a recently promoted side that survived the the relegation playoff and knocked out San Etienne um, in awesome fashion. I'm very happy to see that because San Etienne deserved to be relegated. Uh, Leo have sold off everything because the financials within that. It's incredible that this team won league uh, two seasons ago. They are nowhere near to that team this year. Uh, but I think I need to make sure that I'll share on the same level of Leo or even at this league uh, level uh, to trust them yet uh, until they move to plus one doesn't look like that's going to be very likely um on sunday Lons then hosting Brest. currently Lons a minus one uh one goal full goal favorite at home breasts are a great defensive side that have ability i just don't know um that they have much of an offense to speak of and that's been a problem for them for years now uh in terms of their activity in the off season they i guess got pierre lays malou back from uh the premier league because he was previously i want to say at uh nice but not sure um as i'm doing this live i think when i look at they also brought in Math Mathias Pereira Lage from Angers i don't know that there's a ton of goal scoring that's been changed here and that's a big problem because if you're going on the road to Lons who are going to play on the front foot with a ton of ability um they're going to push forward and try to score a ton of goals so i feel like you need to score to hang with Lons here getting that full goal of insurance is a big big number though in this sport so uh, I'll lean to Brest, but I'm not sure I'm ready to play it just yet. Next, we'll go Ren hosting Lorient uh, in the next window on Sunday. Ren and minus one and a half goal favorite. Lorient, not a great season last year, but uh, I feel like they've done a fair amount of of business in bringing in players this year. Um, I mean, bringing in Volgo from uh, Leipzig, who's a backup keeper, isn't as sexy as I'd hope. Um, okay, I could be wrong. They have not been doing a great job of bringing in players or talent, unfortunately. I thought they had done more than that, but I guess keeping Tara Murphy is probably what was sticking out to me as a big deal because I thought he would be moving for sure, uh, 23 year old and a great striker. Uh, the problem is Ren are going to score goals, and I don't think that Lorient can keep up, nor do I think they can sit back and defend effectively because Ren are a great counter attacking side anytime Lorient try to get out. Ren are going to pounce on them, and that's a scary, scary matchup. Last but not least, we'll go to Marseille and Rems. Rems were an awesome team for me. The Champagne Club um, were so good to me last season. Marseille uh, have a little bit of trouble right now. I mean, switching managers certainly are playing in Champions League. Finished second last season, and it felt very, very fortunate to me. Um, they retained a lot of important talent, which is important. They did lose Camara to Aston Villa, and that's a concern. Um, but ultimately... Uh, bringing in Jonathan Claus from from Lulz is also a, a big signing for him, as well as keeping Arkadiusz Milik. I think he's going to need to start Milik um, to really 
have that offense be as strong as it was last year. It was way different when he was there versus when he wasn't. Uh, but I like Rems. They are a great defensive club. Um, they had, unfortunately, they're, they're a smaller budget, so they had to to watch Hugo Ekatike go uh, on loan to PSG, and I imagine that will be turned into a uh, a, a full buy. Also, selling Rakovic, their goalkeeper, to Mallorca is a big, big loss for them. And now that puts them in a position where I don't know what – I can trust with that goalkeeper Oscar Garcia. I really like, and I'm, I'm going to be clued into this matchup to, to see kind of feel what I see in this REM side. Cause they were great to me last year. And I kind of want to back them again, based on all that they did uh, end up buying Gravion from uh, Inter who was on loan last year and also brought in Florian Balogun, a, um, a loanee from Arsenal who seems to be a, a great talent that might end up playing for the U S men's national team. I do think there's enough questions for me about the REMs back line uh with a new goalkeeper because Rakovic was very good for them and without having a Katike up front a lot of that is going to fall on um the the new arrivee Loni Balogun who might not even start initially but I think there's enough questions for me that I, while I do lean to Rome's plus plus one goal uh, I'm not sure that they will will be my best bet from from France for this weekend so in terms of ones that I'm looking at certainly Rems plus one is on the list but I like Brest getting a goal um uh, Twa getting a quarter is of interest. Um, and then there's we got a few pickums, and then Saturday didn't really have a lot on my list and uh, no no interest in this Friday matchup. So I think for my best bet um uh, for this match day, match day one in Liga, I will go with Brest getting that full goal of insurance at Lons, hoping that they will buck the trend and keep this as low scoring as possible because Lons will be certainly out there trying to score as much as possible. So Lons plus one, uh Borussia Dortmund plus. Uh, or excuse me, over three and a half goals. Um, those are the two best bets from the last two. And then from the Premier League, uh, I believe I chose uh, West Ham plus one and a half. Um, and for my overall best bet for this episode, thank you everyone for watching. By the way, you can follow me on on Twitter, the real underscore G Warner, also Instagram, YouTube. Um, give me five star ratings on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening. I'm trying to make sure that I know where to put it. So if I'm getting good ratings there, I'll make sure the stuff is still coming out. I'm going to go with um, the Borussia Dortmund over three and a half as my overall best bet for this first episode. Uh, any feedback, questions, thoughts, comments, feel throw them in uh, wherever you're watching. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing everyone soon. And uh, we'll try to make sure this happens every Friday. That's the plan uh, going forward. Um, and hopefully we can find some winners potentially at a... Uh, <laughs> less a, of a, a time commitment because we're going to have to somehow fit in two more other leagues into this and make it all happen. So thanks for joining. Uh, see y'all soon and uh, have a great start to this season.